Yes, and so we we'd done our, our two weeks of training in this high school, and then we were, we're off on our trip. So this is this is how we got to, we had to go to uh, Sicily. And this is how we got there. We took a bus to uh, Nanaimo, and then we took a ferry across to Vancouver. We took a Air Canada flight to um, Toronto. We took a train to Trenton, Ontario. We got on a, an army army uh, plane and went to Lahr, Germany. And from Lars, Germany, we went down through Italy, and we were on a train, and we had no idea about luggage. Everybody had two bags, and and uh, so we would we would get on this train. We had no interpreter. We had no money. We had no food. We would get on a train. We would throw everything on, and then we someone would speak broken English, tell us this train didn't go to Sicily. We needed to get on a train at the next stop, three stops over. So we would, but you only had ten minutes to do it. So we would throw all our luggage out of the window and grab it, and like systematically get all our luggage to the next train. And this went on and on and on, and we had no food. And someone would run off and try to get money exchanged, but they, we were barely getting back. So finally, we landed in. Uh, in Rome, and our coaches said, enough. Everybody's exhausted. We were over 24 hours traveling. We had no seats in the train either. We had to stand up because we had not reserved. So we got to Rome, and, and our coach went off and found a, a place for us to stay, and she left a player as collateral to keep the rooms for us and came back and got all of us, and then we had to walk to get this, stay in this hotel and uh, and uh, stayed there overnight and then the next day we went to Sicily by train again and we had to catch a cattle car across the across the water to get to Sicily and the cows all around us and we're sitting there too going on this train to get to Sicily so that was our a very memorable trip <laughs> oh my mm. oh my and how long were you there for well, we, we typically would stay there for, uh, we would play in different cities all around. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that they have a lot of sissy, si cities in Sicily, but we'd play in these little towns. We would play probably four or five days. We'd play every second day and go around and play. And then we were we went off to Italy and played more around Italy, too, and different places in Europe. Okay. So it sort of settled into a pattern at some point where you could get your energy, get some food, get some rest right, right. and focus on playing ball. Right, yeah, yeah. But, it, but I mean, it was a lot of, uh, played on a lot of outdoor courts. We mm. would play normally in the evening so the so businessmen could come watch us and because uh, that was who would pay to come in and watch us. And uh, if, it would, if it rained, then we would have to postpone the game till the next day and we'd play in the daylight. It was really hot to play. And they'd try to have the games early in the morning so that you could... You weren't too hot, mm. and uh, I mean, we had to wash all our own clothes, wash your uniforms. Mm. Uh, you know, there was there was a, a certain pattern that we had to follow for sure. sure. Played well, outdoors on the on a on a street. They just mapped off. Uh, <laughs> there were two roads that met each other, and they kind of just cordoned it off and and put a cork down and drew some lines on the court and there were uh, cars going by beeping their horns at us and headlights and people from <laughs> balconies looking down at us watching us play. <laughs> That would be kind of, well, the romantic side of it, that would be kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. As, as long as your knees were okay and your ankles oh, yeah. were okay. <laughs> they were okay then. But. <laughs> um, what was the competition like? Were uh, you getting good competition? Oh, very good, very good. Italy was Italy was one of the first countries to have uh, uh, pro women's basketball. They didn't call it pro, but they paid their players. And they were very good. We were about 12th in the world uh, competition-wise, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, so a lot of the European countries, we all we had very good games with them. The only team that was really out of our out of our league was Russia at the time. Hmm. But everybody else, we were comparable to. Yeah, and would that be Russia at the time or the Soviet Union? It would be Russia, right? Yeah, Russia. Yeah, because yeah. that came later. Yeah. The um, in doing some research on you, which is fun. There's a, some archival photos, and we'll scroll them through the show at, at different times, but. The Russia had one particular player that stood out, of course, because she was, was she seven foot? Seven, seven two. Seven, seven two. two. Yeah. My goodness. So, and you played against yes, her. Yes, yes, several times. Yeah. So there's an adjustment to be made for the whole team when dealing oh, with yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Our biggest, our tallest player was 6'3". And I remember her telling a story that she was at the high post and she had the ball. And she turned around to look over her shoulder and her name was Semenova. Semenova was there. So she turned back quickly around to her right to do a drop stop that way. And she was still there, but she hadn't moved. <laughs> like she was, she was a large woman, like not just tall. She was large. Yeah. yeah. And solid. Solid. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, that'd be an adjustment to play. It'd be a one of sort of thing. Everybody plays one way. Mm. Now, recently, to bring it forward to current times, on Netflix, there's a, a documentary show called The Women of Troy, mm -hmm. talking about USC, women's yes. basketball at the time, and Cheryl Miller. Yeah, I watched that. Yeah. it's um. What did you think of that? Well, she was ahead of her time. She was a, 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 an incredible player. Uh Really, I didn't never played against her. She was a little bit, bit younger than yeah, I was, but yeah. Uh, yeah, she just she was a really a trailblazer, certainly for women's basketball in the states. And absolutely. just watching the whole program, I mean, the funding that they had, the attention they had, um, mm -hmm. and because of Ms. Miller um, drawing that attention, it kind of boosted the whole yes. program up a bit. Yeah, yeah. The uh, so do you have a, a moment in a game, you know, the usual jock stuff, like a highlight in a game or, or one of the bigger moments where it didn't work out so well sometimes, they stick in our bones as much as yes, when we made the yes. perfect pass or the perfect shot. Yeah, or... yeah, that's true. I've got a couple. Uh, uh, one, we were playing in the World Championships, and one of our first games was against Italy. I don't even know where it was, uh, but it was one of those games where I could do no wrong. Like mm. I just was <laughs> stealing the ball all over the place. In fact, um, we might have sent you a picture. That's there's there's one picture that they took of me doing a left hand layup. I looked like yep. I was sky and you're off the way floor. up in the air. Yeah, <laughs> taking that shot. So I scored 24 points, which was unusual for me because I I really didn't have a shot. It was just layups, steal the ball, layups. So anyway, I, I we we ended up beating Italy, which was uh, uh, always a close game for us, but. I got so much attention from then on, like the rest of the, the rest of the tournament. I kept thinking, if you only knew, I'm not an offensive threat. I'd much rather get rid of the ball. But anyway, so that that stuck in my mind. And then another time, we were in uh, we were in Russia at the uh, the World Student Games, and we had a, a particularly tough coach. He was really really demanded a lot of us, and he was really defensively minded. That's why I made the national team for so many years because I was good laterally and good defensively and quick. Mm. And uh, so I went in our first game. I went in. I started the game. I had a steal. I made a layup. Thought I was playing pretty well. He takes me off, and I'm thinking, oh, okay. Anyway, he comes down to me. Says, "Your girl did a crossover on you. Till you're ready to play some defense, stop her from doing a crossover <laughs> on you. You're gonna sit right here on the bench." And I went, "Oh, okay." <laughs> Anyway, I went back out and uh, I was ended up being the high scorer for Canada in the whole, in the student games and like it just played great like it just you know really motivated me to play well. Yeah, and did she cross over on you anymore? After I don't know. Don't I don't remember? know. Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> it's, it's funny, eh, when you're playing in a game and then the coach sees one thing, but you're experiencing something else, mm -hmm. and then you sit down on the bench and the coach gives you direction, and you're like, what the heck? Well, yeah, yeah. What did what did you see that I I <laughs> yeah. did? You know that I exactly. missed. Exactly. Sometimes that works. The physicality of the players nowadays. Um, so if you were a retired hockey player, the typical question is, do you think he could play against the kids that play today? <laughs> right. So that's an it's an equivalent question, right, you know. Right. No, it's, and it's I like, say no, I could not. I I was I I was too slight than. Uh, the way they lost so much contact now, I'd just be pushed out of bounds all the time, and they'd call me for being out of bounds. Like, uh, I, I, I don't think I could survive playing that way now. Hmm. And uh, uh, when I knew I retired was when I was playing senior basketball. And, uh, and senior basketball in, in New Brunswick is really any age. So you could be 60, and you could be playing against somebody that's 16. Hmm. So I was playing in St. John, and uh, our, t our team was called the Fading Glory. So you know what age we were. Anyway, I'm bringing the ball up the floor, and this little little girl, little girl, she was probably 20, 21, she's guarding me full court, and I can't get by her. Because I never had good dribbling skills. I just put the ball out ahead of me. I would dribble one or two times, and then I'd pass to someone. Mm -hmm. So number one, I couldn't get by her. Number two, I couldn't pass the ball very far because I didn't have the strength anymore to get it throw a long pass down the floor hmm. and then no one was helping me because they said no she's story she can she's she, a star. She, can, she can get it down the floor <laughs> so then and then so if i if i did get it down or whatever then uh and then, then i couldn't shoot it beyond the the foul shot a foul shot so i said oh, i think it's time to retire <laughs> so that was it that was my last game yeah not with a bang but a whimper <laughs> yeah 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 no, not with a whimper that's right yeah you know when it's time Fun. <laughs> But, you know, you played for a long time. What, you know, most of your ad adult life, actually. 
Yes, yes, yeah. I, from... I, I, I don't know, and I don't know when that was that I retired because I, I, I certainly played the whole time that I coached, and when I had kids, like I, uh, we hosted nationals here, uh, 1982, and I was pregnant with my son, our second child, and he was due on the day that the tournament was supposed to start. We were hosting at UNB, and I was kind of a, a player coach, and I said, okay, if he's born early, I'm gonna play, super. If he's born later, then I'll just sit and coach coach during the tournament. He was born the day the tournament started. And then he had some jaundice, and I had my blood pressure went up, so the doctor didn't want me to go coach. Like he said, Joyce, I know what these coaches, what you guys get like. And I'm like, no, 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 I'll be fine, I'll be fine. So so I, I go out to coach the game, then he... My son's still in the hospital, and then I get him out the next day, and my mother-in-law brings him to the gym, so that's his first... <laughs> he goes from the hospital to the gym. <laughs> Such a keener. <laughs> yeah, I know. Crazy, crazy. And does he play ball? He did. He did. Yeah. And he's he's involved now. He's the he's uh, works with basketball in New Brunswick as yeah. uh, as a administrator. So in many ways, he never really had a choice, did he? He didn't have a choice. No, no. We took both our children to all all sports that were going on. They were on the sideline all the time. Yeah, that's that's great. The. Yeah. Uh, I'm just think, trying to think of some of the travel stories because I want to segue at some point in, into, you know, what it's like today and how much better it is. It's got to be better than a train and a plane yeah. and, and a oh, bus. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But uh, other stories from the other era so more people are aware of what it was like back then. Were there political battles that were being fought on your guys' behalf to make sure that there was some equity between um, – did Basketball Canada even exist back then? Yes, yeah. yes. So, yeah. you know, attention to the men's game and to the women's game. Not to make it gender-specific stuff, but more developmental. You yeah, know, like, yeah, like yeah. How do we get more women playing the sport? Because you can play it for a lifetime. That's right, yeah, that's right. They, Well, back then I really credit some uh, a few women from uh, Vancouver, B.C. area, that were, were really pushing the game. Darlene Curry, she was one of my early coaches. Pat Jackson from Saskatchewan. Um, uh, there were a lot of real, that, that had started with the national team even before that. I think maybe it started 67 or even before that. We, we Canada hosted the Pan American Games, so they had a team there. And so it kind of got going there. And just people like that that really pushed for it. And there were there were a couple of men, I can't remember their names either, in the Vancouver area that would just go out and get sponsors for us and try to find us something so we would all look the same. And, uh, you know, just gradually making inroads and, and going, I don't think it was it was that they were against the women playing. It was no. just a matter of the men had always done it. And, yeah, you know, the women wanted wanted a chance. Yeah. So how can we carve out our little niche yeah. to do that? Because at some point in time, the men's league went through the same thing. They were yeah. trying to develop um, National Football League. It's not like it is now, for example, in the States. Mm -hmm. It started off with a bunch of grubbies kind of playing on a dirt field yeah. and 100 people watching. It's got to start you know? somewhere, yeah. So, so it builds momentum over time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so Basketball Canada did exist. Did Sport Canada exist back then? Because those two entities yeah. try to support and feed each other. Yeah. It seems to me after I the Olympics know. it kind of sort Yeah, I think maybe after the Olympics it the 76 just ones. right around that it got, it yeah. got going. Yeah, I, I really don't remember. Hmm. All those, all those things, but uh, but certainly, um, uh, as far as the game goes today, like it's, I mean, it's it's growing in leaps and bounds. But I, I've always been a proponent that you've got to see it in order to know that it's there to do. You know, the same way, like uh, uh, my granddaughter said to me the other day, she said, "Where's mommy?" And I said, "Mommy's on the treadmill." And she says, "Mommy's going on the treadmill." You know, and I thought, wow, you know, that that's how it starts. And I remember telling that story to another friend, and she said, yes. Uh, my friend said, uh, her her son said, Mommy, we've got a woman principal. I didn't know women could be principals. You know, so if they don't see it, how can you dream it? Yeah. So that's why it's so important to have female, female coaches, female officials, uh, you know, female administrators, all that so that, so that. Yep. Little so, girls can see that. And, so you experience it, yeah. Yeah. And so that the boys <clears throat> get it too. Yes, you know? absolutely, yeah. And so then it's about merits and skill sets and passions as mm -hmm, opposed mm -hmm. to um, gender and stuff. Right. The uh, With your coaching career, um, like how long did you coach for? It was a good stretch. Yeah, when I first started, I, I went to, well, as you know, I went to, right out of university, I went to Cowansville. Yeah 
to Massey Vanier, and I taught taught and coached there one year. And then I I, I had a, a continuous basketball scholarship from uh, from Canada Basketball, and I it was a four year continuous scholarship. But they just started it when I was in my fourth year, so I wanted to come back. And they just put in fifth year of eligibility, so I decided I would come back and use that that money to get another degree and and an, another opportunity to to keep playing basketball. Mm-hmm. Um, so I came back and did that. And then, uh, right after that, we, we, that was 1974. And then, uh, we were, we were really busy with basketball and I, I, uh, was offered a job as the technical director of basketball in New Brunswick, one of two of us and along with Gord LaBelle. And so I did that for about a year and a half. And then we centralized for the Olympics in 19, uh, summer of 76 in January, we centralized in Halifax for the Olympics. And then um, I got a letter from UNB, asked me if I would like to coach the basketball and the field hockey team at UNB. So I said, sure. sure. I'm getting married in September, but can I postpone it for a couple of weeks and come? So they go found another field hockey coach for the fall, and uh, I came in and did basketball that year. And I did it for uh, four years, and then our first child was born, and I took the, I took, uh, I took the year off to be with her. And... Uh, then I decided I would go back just part time because I really didn't want. I knew what the commitment <laughs> level was, so I uh, I went back part time and the, and I had my choice of field hockey or basketball, and I decided I would go with field hockey to see if uh, kind of get talked into that, but went back with with field hockey. I I loved field hockey; it was a big passion of mine. Mm-hmm. So I went back with field hockey for thirteen years, and then uh, I was just still part-time and my kids were in school by now and I was getting pretty bored at home so I was trying to get on full-time and they weren't offering me anything full-time so I uh, a friend of mine told me that there was a job opening at the sport branch as a sport consultant so I went there and did that for five years and extremely busy with that Canada Games I was an assistant chef for one of the Canada Games and uh then uh, I got a phone call again, and I was in Grand Prairie, actually, at a Canada Games, and I was I had torn my Achilles tendon. I was on crutches. I was exhausted because we were up twelve hour days doing this. My our chef had his brother had just passed away, so he had come out late because he was out of fever. Like it was just a. So yep. when they called me and said uh, we're making the fu- the field hockey position full time, would you come back and do that? So I'm like, yes, I'm coming <laughs> back because I I wasn't a desk person. Yeah. So I came back to UNB, and uh, uh, but I didn't do field hockey. It ended up the basketball job opened up, and I said, "Well, I need a little change. I need a change because uh, from the field hockey, so I'd like yep. to do some basketball." So I applied for the basketball job and got that, and did that for another thirteen or fourteen years till I retired in two thousand six. Interesting how it unfolds. Eh? Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> when you started, when you graduate, to where you end up. Yeah. That story almost sounds like your first basketball trip to Italy or to Sicily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, all over the place. But yeah, I was just in the right place at the right time. I think in yeah. a small province and people looking out for me. I'm very yeah, fortunate. Connected. So that could tie to one of the other themes. Um, New Brunswick is a small province by population. Um, we've got a pretty good infrastructure in place in terms of sport and sport development to a degree. Um, we seem to have reasonable participation levels. But what does it take to get to that next level? And is it worth it compared to participation? If that kind of makes sense. I've had yeah. this kind of conversation with several different people, from administrators to those that play different sports. Um to those that have their theories about you should just do mass participation to improve the overall wellness of the mm-hmm, citizens, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then that deals with obesity and it deals with diabetes, mm-hmm. and you get at it that way. Mm-hmm. My interview with John McGarry from River Valley Health when he was the CEO. Um, John, what would you do to help you know reduce costs in New Brunswick? For, and he said, I'd take $5 million out of my budget and I'd give it to education so they could put phys ed back in all the schools. Mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. can't, but that's yeah, what yeah, I would yeah, do. Yeah, you know? yeah. So... That blend of getting people out and active again and as a lifestyle change, as well as what you just said about, well, when they see it, they'll start to aspire towards mm-hmm, it. So mm-hmm. that's, it hints at elite, you know, your stars can generate a whole flurry of activity once they've achieved those higher mm-hmm, levels. Mm-hmm. It's it's quite something. Yeah, yeah. So there's a blend and balance between right. those parts. And, and it's tough to make administrative decisions 
and we should be focusing on elite athletes putting the resources into that mm. or we should be focusing on grassroots participation put the emphasis mm -hmm. on that can you play in that yeah. space a little bit because you've done you've worked through all of that mm -hmm. for an mm -hmm. extended time yeah i think i think there's a place for everything the, the unfortunate part is it all costs money mm. you know but but we've got to have those elite athletes so other people can aspire to that and i i I was always so competitive. I wouldn't have been satisfied with just a, just a, a participate to play. Like I, I was, I needed, I needed that high level and challenge myself all the time. And I'm sure there are lots and lots of people that are like that. So uh, we need all of that. That's why we need the Canada Games. We need a, a national championship, and we need it televised, and we need it on the radio, and we we need to show people that that's something that you can do. But I also believe in. Um, and I think it trickles down. You know, you've got your pyramid, and it's going to trickle down. There's not going to be pe people that want that. That's why you see it at, at high schools now. You'll see a, a varsity basketball team. You'll see a JV team. You'll see a, a competitive team, and someone that just some teams that just want to practice two days a week and play. And it's important that we that we do all that so that there's a there's a spot for everybody to play it. What would it take for an athlete to make a national team out of New Brunswick? Oh, look, I am so. I I can remember I I I, really, I got involved as a as a coach, and this is me. Like once I get bored with something, I'm tackling something else. I'm adding something else on. So I can remember I was I was a regional coach for field hockey. So I had a. Uh, I had a, an Atlantic team, and, and kids would go and try out for the national team. And I can remember going to this national team, and I was one of the, one of the people that was involved with helping out with the, with the uh, selection. I wasn't on the selection committee, but I was helping out with doing, doing all the drills and things. And, and I can remember them saying, oh, I can't decide whether we'll take this kid from the Maritimes or this kid or this kid. You know, I just can't decide. And I said, don't just take a token Maritimer just for a token. You know, that was making me really mad. Well, they said, oh, okay. And then they didn't bother. And I thought, oh, why did I, why did I do that? Because <laughs> if they take the token Maritimer, then somebody can say, wow, we've got one player that's that made it. You yeah. know, now look what we can do. We can all aspire yeah. to do that. So, hmm. and I thought at the time, it's so much harder for a, for a, an Atlantic athlete. They're just, they're not seen. Yeah. They're not... Uh, they're not promoted. They're, you know, if an, an athlete goes from here, it was only me that was speaking on their behalf. It wouldn't be the six Ontario coaches that were there because they had never seen her. So they're talking about all their players. Yep. So it became a, almost, a, it was a political thing and, and like, a, like I needed to be a lawyer so that I could speak on their behalf and tell them, convince people mm -hmm. of why they should take these players. And, and I think anybody that makes it, then you, you've, You've worked really, really hard. Like we've got a player here in Fredericton, Allie McCarthy, who's who's been at a number of national camps, and she's just close. and And I keep telling her, well, "What do they say you need to work on?" Well, I'm not aggressive enough, or I'm not this, you know. And it's, it's just nitpicking things. And I'm thinking, that girl has got every athletic bone in her body, and just take her, let her have some confidence, and let her go. And we would have this with our when whenever I I went played on a team that went away and many of my teammates have told me this like we had good athletes here but when they got to the next level they were intimidated mm -hmm. and they wouldn't play the same and I'd say to them like I could remember <laughs> one time we were in a national final and uh, and uh, my my teammate my best friend she says to she said to me wow the talk you gave us at halftime wow. We were playing BC in the final of this game, and uh, and before the coach came in, I just got really mad at everybody and said, "What are you doing? You're so intimidated. You can play better than this, you know." And so we went back out and had a great second half. We ended up losing by, a, a, I think, two points or something in the end. If we'd played that way the whole game, you know, who knows what would have happened. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it and that seemed to be a trend that people would go and be intimidated, and they wouldn't go. And my thought, whenever I went, was. I knew I wasn't that good. I knew I had athletic skills, but I knew skill-wise I wasn't that good. But I figured out really early, if I get myself in the best possible shape, once I get there, by day three, day four, everyone else is going to be tired and sore, a little bit slow. And if I'm still fresh, maybe by the third or fourth day, they'll notice me mm -hmm. and we'll see that I'm a hard worker and maybe I'll get my chance. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got my chance. 
that sport culture thing. Um, Atlantic Canada has no professional sports teams. Uh, they do at a lower level. So there is some basketball you can watch in St. John and Moncton. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And there is some hockey that way with Quebec Major Junior. But for the ladies, there isn't much to watch at the level. For football, you get some university sport, but it's not the same as watching uh, the pro level. So that cultural, um, oh, that's what it's like. Uh, there's a lot of times you can go to a football game or basketball game and the players aren't talking to each other. And I'll go because they think, they, they know it from television. Mm -hmm. They don't know when you're there at a game at the next <laughs> level, the chirping that goes on and the yeah. talking. It, it's constant. <laughs> That's right. But in, unless they see it, like you said, unless yeah. you see it, you're not going to be aware of it. So we're missing that element mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. for the cultural stuff. And then because of that, that intimidation when they go to the bigger center or they conceive, you know, perceive it as a bigger center. That reminded me of a scene in the movie Hoosiers, which is now an, an older movie, but when the small hick town team makes it to the state championship yes. in the states the coach has them walk into the 20,000 seat stadium and he gets one kid on the other kid's shoulder and has a tape measure and says how high is that basket <laughs> it's like 10 foot you know how far is it from the foul line it's 15 yeah it's just like our barn back home right yeah, yeah, yeah. and then all the kids are like oh yeah and they go off to get changed for practice and the two coaches look at each other and go this place is huge <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know but uh, yeah, so that's exactly it you yeah. just have to go experience it and mm -hmm. so that means getting players out of here so you know during um your coaching days was there a structure to get the you know the four or five and i don't even want to call them token it's just regional picking of a team and then you all end up in in the pot somewhere in ontario or bc or maybe quebec and then you're all trying out for the national team or the junior national team that whole experience yeah, here because yeah. you got to get the player over the hump of don't be intimidated because right. the net's this high and the That's free right. throw line's there yeah and unfortunately it's not like they got two and three chances to do that they had kind of had to show their show what they could do on their first shot like i i had a player uh laura swift who i thought i just thought she could play on the national team but the time that she came up to try out the the national team was really solid they didn't have any openings of, you know the players had been there for two or three years and no one was quitting and and you know she would have fit in really well but I could see why they wouldn't take her but I, and there's her there's her spot her shot and she wasn't fortunate enough to do that so so it's hard it's hard like to prepare to prepare an athlete and to get an athlete that wants to do that like I found it a little bit easier in field hockey to tell you the truth than in basketball like yeah. uh, with basketball coming from the Maritimes you had to have a, an extra special skill like you had to be you had to be tall you had to be a, a, an unbelievable shooter you had to be really quick or you had to have some niche in order to do that and with field hockey it seemed to be a little bit easier because um, I had the greatest kids who would work so hard we we were I would like I said I was one of the regional coaches for field hockey and uh uh, the coach at the time was a, a South African woman, Marina Vandemerva, and she she got into fitness long before other other coaches did. So, and Canada came up and did really well because they were fitter than a lot of other countries at the fit again. Even though field hockey is not a really a Canadian sport hmm. compared to the rest of the world, but she got Canada very respectable. And the way she did it was, she said, "Okay, we're going to run a, a time five thousand meter every week." And we're going to do it until you're not hating it. And you know what we do? We learn in Fredericton, right? You want to run a time to 5,000 to where you do it? In the Aiken Center, around the concourse, 21 laps around the concourse on concrete. So I had about, <coughs> about eight athletes at the time who were just, they would do anything for me. Like they were just great, great kids. And they wanted, they wanted to aspire to that, ne that next level. So every week they would run it and they had to run it in under I think they had to run it under 21 minutes and they were running like between 18 and 19 minutes all of them like they were they were just booting around there and I thought I could not do this hmm. I could not do that every week and here these girls are doing that and we got quite a few players from 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 New Brunswick on national teams because those girls were willing to do that and willing to work hard and hmm. and uh, show their stuff and that all ties to the exposure to it too, um, meaning that this is what it takes to play at that level. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to break that culture of how it's done here or the way it's always been done 
to the goal. No, no, but if you want to play at this level, compete at this level, you need to not do it just this. You That's need right. to add all these you other things. Have you need another, know? yeah. And some, some parents will push back on that. Um, some kids or players will decide, yeah, it's, you're asking me to do too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It reminds me of um, conversations I had decades ago with Charlie Bourgeois when he'd retired from playing hockey with St. Louis Blues and set up an elite hockey program mm -hmm, out of Moncton mm -hmm. because he recognized in Atlantic Canada there was no school that brought it to that other yeah. level that he mm -hmm. was aware of that he had to go away for to do. Yes, that's right. And so we had a nice chat for a couple hours, but he was talking about some of the parents who had bought into the program, and then halfway through they were like, well, you're working him too hard. And yeah. he's going, well, we're actually toning it down a touch. you yeah, know. So yeah, we're giving yeah. you 80% instead of 100%. Mm -hmm. So that's a moment in time where, you know, is is the culture ready to that's push right. that hard yeah. for younger people to go? That's true. Yeah. And, and that's not to stretch it to the extreme like we see in some documentaries from China and stuff where children at the age four and five are screened by genetics almost right, that you're right. going to be a gymnast and you're right. going to be on the rings and, yeah, you know, yeah. like we haven't. I haven't got that, that far. far. Although I'd be Thankfully. interested, in, I'd be interested in that with my grandkids. Yeah. What sport with, should you be in? Like I've got a really athletic yeah. grandson that I'm thinking, and a granddaughter on the other side that I think they're they're quick, they're fast, they're athletic, they're coordinated. I wonder what sport would be best suited to them. You know. And then and then like put that. them there. We hear yeah. these stories a lot in the hockey world. So a character like Wayne Gretzky at the age of 13 or 14, playing with 16, 17 year olds, but he has to leave home. Yeah. In yeah, order to yeah, go yeah. do that. And, you know, for New Brunswickers, it might be that they have to leave here in order to find that other level. Yeah, I know. I, and I had uh, I had uh, nieces and nephews that uh, aspired to be hockey players, and they ended up going down to prep school in the States when they were like, I think, 14 or 15 or something like that. And I thought, well, I don't know if I can do that. I really don't. So there you go, you know. And, I, and I've, I've been at that level, but... Mm -hmm. wasn't wasn't willing to do that as a parent so yeah because it does a lot of new brunswickers probably don't know your legacy and it's one of the pleasures of doing the show is that uh, whether you know it was um different theater performers or different retired politicians or business people the pleasure of doing the show is that there's a record now mm -hmm. of the stories yeah, I and, yeah. <laughs> and and here's someone who's kind of been here done that and come back and made New Brunswick a better place, you know, because of being around and contributing back from what you've mm -hmm. learned. Um, I'm tempted to keep exploring the, the women in sport thing because from my experience, uh, it's almost there from where it was in your era to, to where we are. I know there's some institutions that are still stuck with, um, but it'll be stuck on money, mm -hmm. you know, which is unfortunate because that shouldn't be where it's stuck. Mm -hmm. um, or access to facilities, but it seems like there is more options available and more participation. Um, soccer is one of the obvious ones. The participation levels in soccer seem almost equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And recently, TSN ran a, a feature about how um, participation in sport for women drops off at 18 or 19. Even younger than that, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, any thoughts about that? Because you've, you've been through yeah. the gamut with all that stuff, as well as the decades now of watching the sport sports evolve different ways and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the physical skill sets changing. But did the culture shift enough or did the aspiration to, yeah, this is part of my lifestyle. I'm going to go run around the Aiken Center 21 yeah, times, yeah, yeah. you know? Well, see, I had two older brothers when I was growing up, so I, I wanted to be doing whatever they did. They played ball, they played hockey. I couldn't mm. do those things. They didn't have ball or hockey for girls. So, mm. uh, and, and coming from an athletic family, dad was very athletic. So, so, so that was my motivation to do that. And also phys ed was my favorite subject in school because so, I could run and play and do it, learn all kinds of new sports. And now, um, now, uh, I think with girls, it's there's so many other options out there, and that competitiveness with girls, I I found that it's the social part is really important to them more than the competitive part. So they want to go to a social something that's you know as long as their friends are playing, as long as their friends are doing it, then then they and then if their friends one or two friends start to drop off or they get interested in something else, then it's it's you know or they're they're 
too quick to judge, too quick to make a decision, too quick to say, I'm not liking this. I don't want to work so hard. I don't want to. I, that's what my thoughts and why the why they're dropping off. Like you know, not not everyone, but more so than the boys. Like hmm. like um, like I I know when I used to I used to call girls to come out to scrimmage, and I'd say, Hey, I want to come out to have a scrimmage. And yeah, 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 I'll be there. But I had to call 20, 25 girls in order to get 10 there. Whereas if I called 20 to 25 guys, every single one of them would have been there. Hmm. So, so you know. this is an interesting example. So some would say that's a gender difference. Uh, it might be. It's just an aspiration difference. I'm just not interested mm. in playing that hard. You know, it's maybe it doesn't break down on gender lines maybe it breaks down on another thing yeah 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 it could be and m maybe that's where you need the more recreation hmm. spot you know like like the fact that uh not everyone wants to devote their whole life to this sport and go seven days a week and go two three times you know not everybody aspires to 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 be at the top level yeah. you know maybe they just want to go just to break a sweat and do a few things so you know twice a week is yeah. enough for that that person so you've got to have all all different levels is there a difference between how how men play basketball or sport in your experience and then how women play it well you know i think it's a confidence level okay absolutely a confidence level like like if i when i scrimmage with guys if i say to somebody you're a ball hog and they'll go yeah whatever <laughs> You know, they won't, they won't, nothing would happen with it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, or I say, yeah, you've just shot the ball three times, pass the ball or, you know, whatever else. And they go, hey, look, so what if I miss three? I'm going to make the next one. Hmm. Whereas girls, if I said that to them, they would be crying. They would be, uh, they would probably quit the sport. Like I, I could, you have to go at it a different way when you're talking to women. And I don't know, I, the culturally, the way our genes are, I don't know what it is, but I mean, there are some that you could talk tough to, yeah. but most of them you, because if I said 10 negative things to a girl, if I said 10 positive things and one negative thing, the only thing they would remember was a negative thing. Whereas with boys, like uh, girls are always, you know, oh, I missed that shot. I better not shoot again. I, you know, but boys, boys would say, well, I missed that one. I'm going to make the next one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm going to make the next one. And, and very few women have that, that mentality, that that toughness that's and that's fascinating too because that's you're surfacing something that's not uh apparent you know because mm -hmm. you just watch people play mm -hmm. but you're just giving us a glimpse behind the scenes so coaching for you female athletes was was a different approach you had to um appeal to your audience audience in a particular oh, yeah, way yeah, yeah. to make I mean, sure that absolutely. they got it yeah and you found there's a difference between the two. And oddly enough, you would think the game is just the game. And, I know. And players just play, that? and it sort yeah. of doesn't matter. And yeah. coaches have their relative styles, so some of them will be, you know, um, enforcer types, and mm -hmm. other ones will be cuddling types, and other ones will be strategic types, and other yeah. ones will be motivational types. Yeah. Wow. It was a, there was a lot, of, a lot of psychology involved. That you and you know I, I you know I could line six players up and I could say I could I could be tough with that one like I I I I, I would regularly do this during a season I would kick a player out of practice just to motivate the rest of them saying well, she kicked her out you know and so in field hockey I would do that and it would be a girl that was quiet as anything and you know she might do two or three things and I just say that's it practice is over till carol you know get out and then the team would get together and they go oh no you know and it, and it would motivate everybody and it would be great good change for the season it was just all psychological if i did that in basketball well i did it in basketball first of all her dad calls me up and says when can she come back to play and i'm like as soon as she comes in and talks to me like <laughs> not you she comes in and i said this is not a big deal i'm just trying to set an example like i'm i'm the coach so she can't be barking at me or barking at other players or whatever else, but, but just the difference in, in, in how you do that or what the players like, you know, and this, this other girl was, she always used to say to me, I can't believe you play me so much. And I said, well, she wasn't athletic, but she was just very smart. And I would say, you've got to, you've got to guard, you've got to guard this girl and I don't want her to touch the ball. And she'd go, well, what should I do? What should I do? I said, you're going to figure it out because you're athletic and you've played lots of sports and you're going to know and sure enough she did so you know she was fine but 
you know, and then, and then I'd have other kids that would say, could you come in the gym and shoot with me? And I said, well, can't you get, why do I need to be your rebounder? Can't you get a, some guy or some other bay else to shoot and rebound with you? And I said, I'm not going to tell you that your thumb needs to be moved one quarter of an inch in order to improve your shot. You've got to figure that out. You've got to take lots of shots so you figure it out. Not me telling you every time. And don't look over the bench at me every time you do something wrong because I'm not going to be telling you either that that's good or that's bad or you, you know, not going to get reinforcement from me that way. When you come off, I'll tell you why you're coming back off and what you need to do to get to do to go back on again. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's just interesting, just the, the personal different personalities that you have. Yeah. I used to have a girl that would she uh, she did not want to shoot the ball. She just wanted to make the beautiful pass to everyone. I said, I said, no one guards you because they know you're always going to pass. So I said, in order for, in order for you to keep playing, you're going to have to take three shots a half. So she would go out there every time she got the ball. One, two, three. First time she got it. <laughs> done that, now. That's not done now. <laughs> now I don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Mm. <laughs> the, um, no, don't lose it, Dennis. There was a, a string of a, a new direction in what you were talking about with the sports psychology. Ah, in around the 90s, a fellow named Gardner wrote a book called Seven Theories on Intelligence. I'm trying to get away from the IQ-based okay. stuff and get into more um, broader things. So I think now it's expanded to 20 or 25 theories on intelligence. Yeah. But he was the first one in the early 90s to come up with uh, these seven categories, of which one I remember clearly, which is body kinesthetic. And meaning um, there are some athletes who seem to know way ahead of time what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and... So he interviewed Larry Bird, Wayne Gretzky, uh, those kind of characters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, I can't remember if there was any female athletes in a, in a study. Um, there were some dancers, some musicians, yeah, yeah. where they saw it well before it happened yeah. and could move their body in space mm -hmm. and time in order to be where the puck was going to be because mm -hmm. he knew beforehand. And everything for the, him was moving in slow motion. Mm -hmm. um, there's some particular football stories where their quarterback – before the snap of the ball, even though a different play was called, just kind of knew, oh, this is what's going to happen now. And he literally couldn't see where he was throwing the ball because there was too much pressure. But the receiver who was going to be receiving the ball said, yeah, I saw it. So two people were having the similar thought yeah, at yeah, the same yeah, time. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that's an awareness mm -hmm. or on a presence. That, uh, do you have any stories like that? Or does that sound like something that's legitimate to you? That there's... Absolutely. Absolutely. I think a lot of, a lot of players see their sport in slow motion or it looks it certainly looks like they're playing in slow motion with their decision making and doing all that I I don't know if I had that or or if uh, or if, or if playing at a high level uh, increased my skills so when I when I came back to play at another level that I was I was that way but I, I can remember my best friend saying Telling her, telling her teammates, do not take your eye off Joyce because she'll hit you in the head with the ball. So make sure you're watching the ball all the time. <laughs> yeah, because you don't know when it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And with coaching some athletes, where there's some players who just seem to intuitively know their their body just seemed to move through the space with the knees. Oh yeah. And... Oh yeah. Just uh, just had some. I had a lot. I had a lot of athletes that. Um, uh, just could figure it out. They just, they just, uh, they just had that sixth sense or something, and you didn't have to map everything out with them. It was, it was not black and white for them. Whereas other players wanted it really black and white. And uh, those are the players that are fun to coach because they could, they could ad lib in a game, or they could, uh, they, they would see something that maybe you hadn't seen, or they would tell you, or yeah, I, I had a, I had a few like that that. that uh, that were particularly fun. I had a, I had a field hockey player once. We had an Atlantic indoor team that was just phenomenal. We won, uh, we won nationals like, two or three years in a row. And they were, players from everywhere from Newfoundland all the way over. And she was happening to be coaching at St. Mary's at the time. And she was just, she was just so fun to watch because she was so skilled. And we had a men's team that we used to play quite regularly, uh, just to get us more competition because. Uh, the guys weren't particularly skilled, but they were faster and stronger and everything. And she would just, some guy would do something to her, and she'd just look at him, and the next time she'd just go, zip, 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 z
<laughs> but she was so fun to watch and just competitive and uh, give her a reason. Like she, she was one of, <laughs> one of those kids that oh, I'm bored with this. Give me something that, you know, I'm going to get excited yeah. about. <laughs> well, that's fun. Mm. Um, totally different tack. Well, um, what's it like being a grandma? <laughs> <laughs> she needs you. We're recording this in early June of 2020, and we're still in the throes of COVID-19. And grandmom here has had the grandchildren for a, quite a stretch. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I, we're really we're really fortunate. My son lives here in town, and they have he and his wife have three children, uh, seven, five, and three. And so we get to see them quite often, and we're in their bubble, the COVID bubble. So we we they're at our house, or we're at their house quite a bit. And then my daughter lives in Newfoundland, and she's a, a frontline worker, a, a doctor, and her husband is she's a, a GP, and her husband is a respirologist. So when this all all happened, they were really nervous that they would get it and bring it home to their kids, and they had no support services there really. The Daycares were shutting down, so they decided they would bring their children to us. Uh, we live uh, fairly isolated in the country, and uh, they thought it would be a, a good time for the girls to bond with us. So we had them for 75 days, and well, let me tell you, I'm not 30 anymore. <laughs> it was difficult, but but it was fun. We built a lot of memories with them, and uh, it really is quite fun to be a, to be a grandmother and to be able to dev devote all your time to them. And uh, much different from a parent because you've always got some underlying thing I've got to get ready for. I got to get I've got to get this or I've got to get this. And with grandparenting, you just you're just in the moment with them, and they love that. Just the kids. Mm -hmm. And your energy held up. Well, it did, but as soon as they left, I crashed. I couldn't believe it, it was like a Mack truck hit me, and it was it was a good week before I felt like I'm going to survive. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> it was hard. Yeah. Um. We can wrap it up now. Any any final thoughts? Um, I'm thinking to, to set this up a bit. Um, you have a legacy and a, a, an achievement level that most people don't know about. <clears throat> and you've had all these moments of teaching and coaching other people. So your tentacles are quite stunning, actually, if that makes sense for what you've had to experience and got to experience to how you pass it on through coaching and teaching and are there any kind of words of wisdom that that uh, say there's a 15 year old ball player out there watching this and saying, "Who's that gray haired lady talking about <laughs> basketball in 1975?" I wasn't even born yet, you know, yeah. that I kind of that thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but about about just a, a life's journey, and and um, and a female athlete's journey, and a high level of achievement journey, and and back home journey. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know. I didn't have to leave in order to do it. I mean, it was a different time and era, but uh, I found my own way to do it. And I didn't know at the time we had no, no one was sending us training programs or anything. I just, I just made up games all the time. Like I would go in the gym and I would, I would shoot ten foul shots if I missed any of them. Then I would, I would make myself run a set of lines or a couple of set of lines, and I would shoot again. And I, I just kept kept challenging myself all the time and and I would skip and then I'd get bored with skipping so I'd try something else and uh, um, so I think I was known as one of the fittest players to ever play in the national team but that was my niche for getting in so and I've seen I've seen players that have the uh, athletes that have that have made it by staying home I've seen other athletes that have that have had to go away I've got a I have a, a great niece in the Riverview area who's a fantastic swimmer and uh, she's staying home right now and hoping to make the next Olympics and uh, and working so incredibly hard. And with this COVID go come, going on, she's had to make her own pool and get a harness set up so she can swim in her pool with a, some resistance to it, put it in her garage, like all kinds of things. But that's those are the athletes that, that do well and do make it. And and. I think anybody, if they've got a mind to do it, anybody can do it. Really, I do. One last question. What makes you happy? Well, um, uh, doing three physical things a day makes me happy. Might not be three anymore. Might be, <laughs> might be down to two, but I, I, I do like being physical. 
I like spending time with my kids. And I think my kids are hilarious. We're all, they're always messaging and uh, they're just so quick witted and, and bright, bright. I'm really happy with them. Of course, the grandchildren, absolutely. And, yeah. and spending time with my husband, like we're, we've got a lot in common, so we're doing lots. So it's a good time in my life, really. Hmm. That's a whole other avenue we could have gone down. Maybe another day, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's true. Different eras in the things we do in different eras of life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for this. Okay, thank you. It's interesting. And thanks for watching. As always, if you want to support the show, go to thedentistreport.ca, click PayPal or Patreon. Be good, have fun, love each other.